A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for registering for this and joining us today for this um, uh, webinar that we are organizing, especially for the SMEs to access uh, the markets in the UK. We realized that this was a crying need given that our SMEs don't have too much support, uh, don't have too many places to go to to get information. Uh, so we put a panel together. We have an expert panel today uh, ably man, uh, moderated by an expert in, and, and an SME herself. Uh, so I think it's going to be a, a super event filled with um, information and uh, quite useful. We have, uh, yeah, if I can, while we wait for the High Commissioner to join us, I, we will start the session and I'm sure she will join us uh, through the program. Uh, our purpose in doing this uh, CBB or the Council for Business with Britain, as you know, is the organization that uh, the bilateral trade organization that promotes trade between the two countries and FDI into Sri Lanka. So it is a go-to organization for anyone to come in terms of getting information, getting leads to dealing with the UK in terms of business. Uh, therefore, I know we have a large crowd joining us today. And I would urge all of you to get membership with the Council for Business with Britain, which is under the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, so that you have access to all of that. We are also members of the British Chambers of Commerce, which has 60 British Chambers worldwide. Uh, and you gain access to all of that uh, by having membership with us. So with that said, uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Ranganathan of uh, Commercial Bank, the MD of Commercial Bank, who heads, uh, who's a committee member and who also heads the SME committee on our CBB uh, main committee uh, for putting this together and also for Commercial Bank and the team at Commercial Bank for coming forward and organizing this. Thank you very much to Mr. Ranganathan and the team at Commercial Bank. With that, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Tanya Vethamuni, uh, Tanya Polonovita Vethamuni, who is no stranger to the business community in Sri Lanka. She's a self-made entrepreneur uh, and the group managing director of IAS Holdings, an entity that she started in 2016. Um, after 20 years of uh, serving in the field of logistics, this is not her first company. I know she's almost like a serial entrepreneur. So you couldn't have a better person than Tanya moderate the session. She knows what it is like to start from scratch uh, and grow a small business into what it is today. She's no more an SME today. She's a big group of companies in the logistics area. Under her guidance and leadership, the company obviously uh, has been successful in securing joint ventures with a multitude of multinational logistics and supply chain companies within its corporate portfolio. Among her many business accolades, she was awarded the Outstanding Woman Entrepreneur of the Year last year for 2019-2020, and also served as the first female chairperson of the Sri Lanka Logistics and Freight Forwarders Association, which is generally a male-dominated association and an industry, I might add. Uh, she's been a vice president of CBB. Uh, recently, she was the treasurer of CBB. She served CBB for many long years and is a dedicated member of our council. Thank you, Tanya, for agreeing to moderate the session today. Uh, over to you. I'm sure you'll introduce the panelists and take it from here. Thank sure. you very much. Thank you, Roshani, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone joining from UK. And good evening to all participants here in Sri Lanka. Thank you for taking time out to attend this session organized by Commercial Bank PLC, collaboration with the Council for Business with Britain in Sri Lanka. The purpose, as mentioned by Roshani, of this session is to discuss practical learning, inspire insights, and provide information on British markets and the different avenues of opportunities, specifically for SME businesses. We hope at the end of this session, each and every one of you will take away some learning as to how to expand your business to UK. Before we start our discussions, 
I would like to present you with some trade statistics between Sri Lanka and UK so that everyone has an understanding of where we are at this moment of time. SME make uh, up to 42% of the contribution to the country's GDP, making 75% of the total number of enterprises. 45% of the workforce is employed in the SME sector. SMEs make up to 20% of the ex uh, exported goods and 30% of the production value. Micro establishments dominate by trade while small and medium scale businesses, business units are dominated by industry. On that note, I'm pleased to introduce our panel of experts this evening. Let me start with Dr. Lakmini Mendes. Dr. Lakmini Mendes has been serving in the capacity of Minister Co Commercial at the Sri Lanka High Commission in London since May 2019. She has more than 20 years of work experience in public, private, and semi-government organizations bearing different responsibilities and performing diverse role as a country representative, a trade expert, negotiator, commercial and trade officer, lecturer, resource person, management consultant, market research, and a banker. Glad to have you on board with us, Dr. Lakmini. Next up, we have Mr. Suresh Dimel, no stranger to all of us, Chairman of Export Development Board, EDB. Mr. Dimel's company, Lanka Fishing Flies Private Limited, creates handcrafted artificial sport fishing bait for export to niche market in the USA and the world. What started as a cottage industry in his hometown in Nugegoda today employs 200 women in Nugegoda, Tangol, and Ratnapura and celebrates producing the world best quality fishing flies for the past 40 years. Suresh believes in building strong strong ecosystem, local and global, that empower and improve lives of people through collaborative and inclusive relationships. He also strongly believes that people working together can make Sri Lanka the wonder of Asia. Thanks for joining us, Suresh. Moving on, we have Mr. Irfan Tassim, CEO of Ocean Peak Private Limited and committee member of CBB. Mr. Tassim spent nearly two decades in the apparel, textile industry in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, primarily serving in CFO and CEO positions across multiple businesses of Brandex Sri Lanka, premier apparel exporter. After his first exploratory tour to UK in 2011, Irfan ventured into entrepreneurship and set up his own business, Ocean Peak, Ocean Peak South Asia's inaugural oceanic farm for fin fish producing barramundi based out of Trincomalee, Sri Lanka. Great to have you, Irfan. Lorian Somanada, Chief Manager Exports, Commercial Bank PLC. Mr. Lorian Somanada serves as the Chief Manager heading the Export Division at Commercial Bank. He has over 30 years of banking experience, which includes 70 years in trade finance, handling import and export with experience in corporate banking and branch banking. Thanks for joining us, Lorian, this evening. Mr. Chin Pereira, Director of Universal Supply Limited, Universal Europe Supplies BVT. Mr. Chin Pereira is the Director of Universal Suppliers Limited and Universal Europe Suppliers BVT. The organization represents well-known Sri Lankan and Asian brands on an inclusive basis, exclusive, sorry, exclusive basis and his establishment itself as the largest importer of food and beverage from Sri Lanka and Asia to UK and to Europe, which includes entry into 10 major supermarket chains across the region. Welcome on board, uh, Chen. And finally, on our panel is Mrs. Tana Sivasambu, founder of 
Rushi Foods. Rushi is an authentic Sri Lankan packaged food range made with 100% natural ingredients. It is a purpose-driven brand that supports Sri Lankan farmers and creates opportunities in sustainable employment in rural villages by assuring fair prices for ingredients sourced directly from farmers. Rusi Food has successfully established itself in the UK market. London is Tana's home, but her native land of Sri Lanka will always hold a special place in her heart. This is a brief introduction of our panel of expertise this evening. A warm welcome to all of you and thank you for taking the time out to be here. Before we start our discussions, I would like to explain briefly how the format for today will work. Each panelist will direct it with the two or three questions. You will be given three to four minutes due to time constraint in which to answer the question in order to keep within the duration of the session. Just a little housekeeping for the audience before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. You can type your questions in Sinhala or even Tamil, whichever the language you prefer to communicate. We will bring them up during the presentation and we will also have a time for questions at the end. One more request, other than the speaker, we would request all of you to please have the camera switched off and go mute for the clarity purposes. Let's start. The first question this evening of this interesting session goes to uh, Mr. Lorian Somanada and to Mr. Suresh Dimal. There's a widespread of consensus that SMEs can fuel and drive economic recovery. Figures from the Atlantic Council suggest that in developing markets, SME contribute 40% of the GDP, generate 70% of jobs, and typically have a high share of female ownership. Conversely, SMEs took the brunt of the economic decline due to COVID, and economic recovery will depend on their ability to bounce back. So the question, what support has been made available to SMEs in general to survive the pandemic and to recover? If none, then what should be made available? So it goes to uh, Lorian and to Suresh. Maybe we'll allow uh, uh, Suresh to answer and then Lorian, maybe you can take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, and good afternoon. Um, the government support has been in the form of uh, loan moratoriums and uh, low interest rates and uh, the general um, financial support. You know, uh, I think the government has just done the uh, loan moratoriums and the, the uh, low interest rates. Now, the tricky part about the SME sector in Sri Lanka is that half or more uh, is informal. And when you're informal, you cannot uh, take advantage of these moratoriums or financial instruments, even that the banks offer. Now, I was uh, also saying that, you know, the banks have also offered many different facilities for SMEs these days with the low interest rates and so on. But the informal sector, if, we, if I can sort of focus on the informal sector, which is uh, half or more, we don't have much data on that sector either. And these are the people who would have uh, borrowed from informal sources and are, are having a difficult time. We are seeing an unprecedented um, uh, unprecedented situation in uh, uh, pawn broking these days where people are pawning their gold for money. So this could be some of these SMEs. And uh, 
So we are, you know, I think this is an opportunity for us to formalize or encourage these informal SMEs to come into the mainstream uh, in some way. You know, obviously we'll have to educate them and build awareness and and do a lot of capacity building at the regional level. And this is where I think the black banks can play a big role because they have a regional network and we may have to invite, uh, have workshops to uh, get this in informal sector so that, uh, you know, the SMEs in general, we can be the engine of growth uh, for uh, Sri Lanka's economy. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, so anyone who's uh, participating, and if you have not formalized your business, you heard from Mr. Suresh Timel, please do consider formalizing your businesses and uh, reap the advantages that is being offered by the banks and by the government today. Rorian, over to you. Thanks, Tanya. Just to uh, give an idea of how did the banks uh, accommodate this particular situation. So the SMEs uh, really had to face uh, many challenges due to the unprecedented situation that emerged due to the pandemic. So now we basically operate on a new normal situation where everything has changed. And during difficult times, how far we have gone uh, supporting the SME especially, and even the other corporates or even other exporters who are into business. Just to give a brief idea, uh, during the first two waves of uh, COVID, uh, we extended uh, monitorium facilities uh, or monitorium to over 15,000 SMEs. And uh, when it came to SA, uh, uh, giving concessions, there was around 5,000 SMEs who benefited on the concession. In total, there was around 105 billion, which has been dispersed by the bank in facilitating whatever the, the crisis that they have faced. So how did we do? What, uh, what, are, what were the main areas that we focused was was basically we gave these debt monitorium uh, arrangements to SMEs. Then we in, uh, went and uh, extended, uh, introduced various uh, concessionary rates in order to, depending on the client's requirement, we gave them time to repay their loans, reschedule their loans, and made them more comfortable in order to overcome this particular situation. So the loan restructuring was done, rescheduling was done, into, uh, and in order to meet their cash flows. So that was uh, some of these things. Then further we do, went and did the, uh, we gave them uh, rebates on interest. We conducted awareness programs to revive or uh, to be able to sustain their promo uh, particular business, what methods that they couldn't do. And we continuously kept, uh, we kept uh, a vigil with them. Uh, we continuously were able to correspond and see what their requirements that were there. So these were some of the uh, key uh, key areas that we focus in uplifting these SMEs during this period. So on the exporter side, of course, we had difficulties. Uh, many exporters found, though they shipped their goods, they found their documents not reaching out to other destinations because those destinations were, so, were also under the lockdown and they were unable to, uh, the courier companies or maybe the shipping companies were unable to deliver the particular documents for the buyers to take control of their goods. So there were enough and more difficulties with, uh, which uh, uh, resulted after, after this pandemic. So these, uh, we looked into these uh, issues and we helped out many exporters to overcome these difficulties, get their shipments cleared out uh, very quickly to limit their demurrage. So these were some of the uh, initiatives that the bank took in helping out uh, the industry. Uh, thank you, Lorian. Uh, there are some, some areas that you mentioned probably we will speak about again um, because some clarity is needed, but we will get back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Welcome, uh, Dr. Lakmini, I don't know whether you were online when, when we started the session. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a question for you. Uh, Dr. Lakmini, you have served in the private, public, and semi-government sectors in diverse roles, specifically as a trade expert. In your opinion, what are the business opportunities in the UK market, and what is the best way to position products, uh, products in the UK market? Uh, thank you very much, Tanya, and also for the generous introduction. 
And at the same time, let me uh, say a very good afternoon to all who are joining from Sri Lanka and also good morning to all joining from UK. Yes, it's a very interesting question. So uh, when I look at the phase statistic, what do I see? I see many opportunities. It's like my glass, water glass, it's like, it's half full. And so that for me, it's full of opportunity. And uh, to start with, Sri Lanka is the second, the UK is the second largest export market for Sri Lanka. And it's about 1 billion US dollars. And when you look at the products, 75 to 78% consists of all apparel products. And which covers after 61, 62, and 63. So the point I want to make here is the opportunity is there in one way because Sri Lanka has been branded for apparel as well as for tea. So whoever wants to explore the apparel sector, that is an opportunity because Sri Lanka has been branded already. At the same time, we see the need for diversification because 75 to 78% is huge and is concentrated on one area, one sector. So that again is the message, the need for diversification. So when diversifying, the ways that we promote is value-added products as well as non-traditional products. So let me give some examples that we can think of what it was in the past and also during the COVID and also in the post-COVID era. Like me, people know about our Ceylon, but Afterwards of COVID, as well as during COVID, there was a great demand for herbal teas. So the herbal tea mixed with ginger, turmeric, or cinnamon, or moringa, we call murunga. So that's another opportunity that was seen in the market. And when it comes to rubber products, yes, we know we are known for these rubber tires and the gloves. But beyond that, there is a demand for toys. And even the toys made of rubber, dog, toys. So when it comes to coconut products, a decade ago, there, wouldn't, there wasn't this coconut cream sold in the supermarkets. But what do we see now? The shelves are filled with coconut based products. Dr. Lakmi, may I interrupt with you? Uh, we have some comments said the line is not very clear and they cannot hear you properly. Is it possible for you to speak a little bit louder if you don't mind? Sorry to have disturbed. Thank you. Yes, I'll do my best. There is some problem with the internet. Anyhow, um, so let me quickly recapture. That is an opportunity for well-weather products as well as uh, the non Products. Can you hear me, Tanya? Is it clear now? Slightly, slightly better. Um, yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, I took some examples just now that to start with tea. So you can knew our Ceylon tea, but during the post-COVID and the COVID and uh, during that era, what did we see for more opportunities, more demand? for the, the herbal teas, I would say. So that's why made out of, made with winter, turmeric, or cinnamon, moringa, and so on. So the same way, there is a demand for these rubber products, not only tires, but even like uh, toys for pets and the dogs and so on. And for the coconut as well, as, as I mentioned, and for the spices. So when it comes to food, it's interesting. We've seen, because we meet buyers, we talk to them, and especially after COVID, because now we have the opportunity to meet them physically. And that's the best, I always say. So we come across the different demands that they uh, discuss with us. So one was like, you'll be surprised. One buyer asked us whether Sri Lanka could export some jack. Jack. So being an SME, so that, is, that could be one area to think of. And we, all these ideas, we have all these requests, actually, we have communicated to EDB as well. So whoever is interested, they can get in contact with us or with the EDB or with the chambers. So coming back, so again, there is a demand for this frozen food. During the 
COVID time, we saw how the people made their own food. They could not go to these restaurants. So they were locked in the houses and they tried out different food, meals, and so on. So again, with beverages. Now we see there's a demand for these coconut drink and health, for the health conscious uh, consumers. And these outdoor exercising people, the bicycles and other equipment is one. And again, let me give another uh, interesting uh, example for non-traditional product. Once we had an inquiry for cuttlefish bones. There is the Dalla cutter. Very interesting. And this buyer spoke to me and said, we need four containers, cuttlefish bones. And will you imagine for what? It's a pet toy for the dogs. So likewise, uh, we likewise we get certain inquiries and we channel it to the relevant authority. So once again, these were the products mainly that I have been discussing. When I look at the uh, services side, because some there may be people who are interested in the services and BPM services. And for that, one may ask, how do we know? How do we get to know? We commissioned a lot of programs with SASCOM as well. And in 2019, before the COVID, uh, we had a session at the London Stock Exchange on the IT sector. And uh, one may wonder that this is for the big companies. No, that was small SME companies who were there. And today they have started their own small IT company. So likewise, the opportunity is there if you happen to be there at the right time at the right place, right? And also what we intend is to promote Sri Lanka as a logistic as a marine offshore engineering hub in the Asia, South Asia. So for that matter, we are in the process of working with EDB and also with the chambers over here at Aberdeen Chamber and the Birmingham Chamber to have a webinar. So webinar will be the first step and we will have the networking and to be meeting and it will be extended to a delegation. So be in contact with us to get more details and to be part of it. And also with regard to more opportunities apart from these uh, products and the services, I would say opportunities also changes with the consumer behavior, with their beliefs, with the education, with the consciousness, on the health, the planet, and the human being, the people. And that has an intense impact on what they buy and what they use. At the same time, we have come across buyers reaching us and saying that they want to diversify their supply base. One example was the stationery. So likewise, it can come from different angles. This is a very brief uh, explanation. And Getting back to the second part of the question, how you can grab this opportunity. You may have the brilliant idea, the brilliant dream, but it has to come true. And for that matter, how do you how do we get there? And one would be first would be the information. Get the information as much as possible. Do your research, do a little bit of homework, talk to people, talk to your friends and family over here, and get an understanding about the market, the consumer, things. Speak to us, we are not going to charge you. Speak to the EDB chambers, and we will give you the information what we have. And read the reviews and learn about the things, behavior, consumer behavior, and all what you can. Dr. Lakman, sorry to interrupt. Can we get back to the uh, behavior, uh, customer behavior uh, shortly? Um, are you, are you, uh, how many minutes more do you need to complete this? Uh, I think I need just one, uh, two minutes maximum. Yes, and I'll be done. Okay. So, uh, so the research and information would make a big part and then about the product. Have an idea what you want to export to the market and whether this product is going to be, for example, for tea, I would say. It's for the generation who is drinking Ceylon black tea or is it the generation, the younger generation who would like the fruity flavor or the iced tea or the health conscious uh, consumer who would like herbal tea or organic tea or green tea likewise. Think of the niche. You may not have a clear picture, but you must have a big, I would say, and the amount that they would want to spend. So uh, at the 
same time, have an idea about the compliances, the certification that is needed in the UK market. And when coming to the pricing, this again is very important for SMEs and even for any business. And how can I get some idea about the price? One thing is you can go on to these online, supermarket online, if it's a food product. Just have an idea how much it has been sold in the market. So you get an idea of it. And the pricing. And how do you want to have this product, have your product? Are you going to find an agent? Do you want to do direct uh, uh, directly do you want to sell it or is it online? Online is very popular these days and I'm sure uh, this is the reason why we have the mission has got on board Tana and Chin because Tana yeah, does miracles on her online uh, website so she will be able to explain more about elaborate on the online selling and Chin is an agent and so Chin will be able to give you a lot of insights about how it's been done and the other one is the promotion and which we really lack. So my advice would be have a nice website because it's hard in our days with the restrictions we need the buyers and sellers. So protect yourself on the website, but be honest and have the right information on that. So this becomes a phase for you. And also be prepared to make presentations, send some samples and to participate in fairs when it is available and also have the right attitude. Uh, when working with these uh, UK buyers. And packaging is another important one because sometimes we are a little bit adamant. This is what we have seen. Some uh, suppliers, some companies, or some exporters, they're a bit adamant with their designs. But be flexible because it may not suit 100% in this market. So the color combination and the designs, be flexible to change it if it's needed. And have an idea about the process and procedures. And also, lastly, not least, but have an idea about the competitors. It could be locally, but can be internationally as well. So that's all, Tanya, and maybe I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lakmini. And it's very interesting to uh, realize there are so many non-traditional products are being marketed or they're being promoted. So everyone who's participating, please, uh, have a look at these non-traditional. I think there's great opportunity in UK market uh, for you. Uh, as Dr. Lakmini mentioned, you are well-established business uh, that export produ products to UK. In your experience, what are the challenges and any barriers you encountered at the commencement of your business and how did you overcome this? We would appreciate in brief if you can touch on these points, the barriers, and how did you overcome? Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tanya. Thanks for the uh, introduction, and um, good afternoon to all uh, the participants in Sri Lanka. Um, so yes, in terms of challenges, um, I would say it's twofold. One is um, in terms of breaking into a new market uh, with a new product. So. Uh, learning about the import regulations, um, the customs clearance, what are the documentations. Um, for example, um, rice imports need a license, um, uh, animal-based products um, needs a special health certification. Um, so understanding those regulations in terms of food imports uh, from, from Sri Lanka, and, and also then the um, regulations such as the labeling regulations. So there are the mandatory regulations in terms of the ingredients and what is permitted, what is not permitted. Um, and also in terms of labeling, uh, making sure the customer understands. So um, one of the classic ones is like even uh, putting the, uh, the chili heat, uh, like, you know, mild, medium or hot because uh, educating the customer. So there are a lot of nuances like that in terms of um, understanding the market and uh, learning the regulations and adapting your product to fit the market. That was one side. And the other side, uh, the challenge I would say in um, sourcing the right supplier. So I, I spent a lot of time working with different suppliers and trying to um, match our requirements with what the suppliers are able to offer. So we, as a um, business for purpose, we have like certain um, ethical guidelines that we like to follow in terms of um, ethical sourcing, um, not using artificial um, chemicals or preservatives in products. 
um, and fair paying a fair price to the suppliers. So we needed to identify um, the right suppliers who match our ethical like sort of uh, requirements. Um, and then uh, the MOQ. I know um, SMEs get excited about um, export orders and they think, you know, we're going to be doing large volumes and things like that. But me being SME myself, I mean, actually a micro entity, the volumes are small. And um, so the supplier should understand that in terms of working in small volumes and also understanding the concept of white labeling. Uh, what does it mean? I know a lot of brands, um, when they have established, they're very proud of their own brand. So when you introduce the concept of white labeling, because we, we create a brand to fit the market, to fit the purpose, so we have to come up with a new branding. So the supplier understanding the, white, the issues about white labeling and wanting to work in kind of such an environment under a different brand. Um, and the MOQs, as I said, I mean, um, we are an SME um, myself, so the volumes are small. And also because we, we had a kind of a risk of introducing a new product into a new market, um, we had to test the market. So we couldn't bring um, larger volumes. So we had to test the market in small ways um, and make changes, make adaptations. So. Uh, the supplier understanding those nuances and also the learning and product development. When I say uh, new markets, so we introduced um, Sri Lankan cuisine uh, to, the, to the British market. Um, so Sri Lankan cuisine is new. Um, they're very familiar with Indian uh, and they kind of tend to relate Sri Lankan uh, because of the geographical proximity, they think it's like Indian. But um, we, our, our cuisine is very distinct and very different. So that's why uh, in our range, I chose products like um, kata sambal, sini sambal, pol sambal, because we wanted to create that Sri Lankan identity um, when we introduced the Sri Lankan products. Um, so a matter of educating the customers. And although we wanted to keep the authenticity, the taste, the recipe, we didn't want to modify it to the market, but also adapting to the um, customer behavior. So for example, um, reducing the fat, the, the salt and the sugar um, and you know, testing it. And, and when we started, we had uh, palm oil in our products and the customers didn't like, like it. So we had to do product development and change it to coconut oil or vegetable oil. So the supplier being in that mindset to learning and understanding and engaging in new product development, um, it, it, was, it was a bit uh, of a challenge to start with because um, we were new here in the, under, trying to understand the market and the, for the suppliers, it was new because we were trying to do something different. Um, so I think that that was my, that was my main challenge, but um, coming a long way, fortunately, we've got wonderful suppliers now who work with us and who work in product development, market testing, sending out new recipes, uh, going backwards and forwards. So it, it is an ongoing process. Uh, thanks, Tana. I think uh, takeaway from that is it's very important when we're getting to a new market to understand the customer behavior and the mindset and likes and dislikes, especially in, in your industry, the food, it's, it's a very close to one's heart. So thank you very much, really yeah, appreciate it. One, one interesting, uh, interesting learning for me as well uh, was that when we had our, uh, introduce our pork sambal. Uh, I mean, in the West, coconut is associated with sweet things, chocolates and biscuits and cookies. I mean, they don't think of coconut being a savory or a spicy thing. So although it has in the label, it's got chilies and everything, it doesn't register with people. So they taste the coconut sambal and go, oh my God, it's hot. I'm like, duh, it's on the label, <laughs> like, you know. So things like that, it was, it was interesting. Thank but, you, yeah. thank you, uh, Tana. <laughs> uh, Chin, you have been very successful in the UK market. Uh, can you share with us in brief your success story and advise our SMEs on how to become a successful exporter in the UK market? Uh, very good afternoon to Sri Lanka and very good morning to uh, UK. Well, thank you for the compliment saying that very successful, Tania. Uh, that's a great compliment, by the way. And uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, 
going back to, first of all, uh, thank you for having me this wonderful production uh, of uh, this conference. This is really great. And this is what it actually is being lacking for years and years in Sri Lanka for, for, for many years. So uh, along with the CBP to come forward to the commercial bank and doing such kind of event is a very uh, productive thing. And this is being happening in many other countries and we are participating for uh, to many other countries. So this is a great event. And I, I also want to say, say a big thank you to Suresh from EDB for facilitating this uh, sort of events uh, as always. And Dr. Lakmini being wonderful all the time to have me in the UK. So it's a great uh, asset for us, uh, for us to develop our businesses and expand our businesses and work with Sri Lanka. And as she uh, always being uh, very fascinating of Sri Lanka, uh, of Sri Lankan food. And going back to uh, the questions, Tania, uh, uh, probably the, question, the answers that I'm going to give it to you is, uh, will be in very ground level ones. Because I think that's what uh, the people would expect to see from us. Uh, the real output of, of, of what the exporter should be doing in Sri Lanka to become a, a successful exporter from Sri Lanka, because I myself was exported from Sri Lanka before I being started to import in, in the UK. And uh, even in the UK, we started very small, although we are into a very a big, a good major supermarket chains, uh, not just the UK, uh, across the U, uh, UK as well. Just to give you a bit of a background of, of the UK, as you all know, UK has uh, 67 million population in the UK. So, and the UK is the seventh largest economy in the world. So you can imagine UK is being one of the uh, very outspoken place for your export businesses. And then I want to give you a very good insight. The biggest import of the UK is, uh, uh, is USA at the moment. And the second is the EU. Although our largest uh, uh, partner is uh, EU, the, the largest, still the largest import is coming from uh, from uh, USA. Why did I say that? Because uh, the, the statistics was uh, laid out and unfortunately there's a huge potential Sri Lanka. And if you looked at the league table, uh, the higher, biggest importers in the, to the UK, uh, uh, at the moment Sri Lanka is not even in the first 50. So uh, that's the real statistics of, of the value from the UKBA. And if you looked at this statistic, the uh, India is a 17th largest uh, uh, imported to uh, UK, 170, 17, and uh, 42nd being the Pakistan, our neighbors. So you can see, if you looked at Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, we almost have the same range of product that we can offer. But India became 17th, and the Pakistan became the 42. And so we have an ample opportunity to become less than 50 or less than 100 in the FMCG range. So what do we have to do? And then also to give you a good idea about India, 70% of Indian, 60 to 70% of Indian exports are from SMEs. So only 30% is coming from the large industry. So it's, there's an ample opportunity for SMEs in Sri Lanka to not to grab Indian or Pakistan, but to enter into this UK market. What do we have to do as exporters to become successful in Sri Lanka? As I said, Tanya, these are very ground level ones but this makes huge difference, trust me on this. Because this is what I have experienced in my 20 years of experience, Sri Lanka versus many other countries. First of all, you need to get your business attitude correct towards the focus on exports. Why do I say that? This is not a blame to Sri Lankan SMEs or to any companies in Sri Lanka. What we have experienced from Sri Lanka is the responses and the flexibilities are in a huge lacking stage. So if there's an inquiry, if there's an issue, if there's a thing that you need to discuss, respond to your buyer ASAP. Just treat that as a yesterday's inquiry rather than today's inquiry. Get on board and try to resolve it and work with your buyer in UK. That's very, very, very unique. And the flexibility. You have wonderful products. There's no question on it. Sri Lanka can have a huge range of wonderful products. But as Tanya explained, or Dr. Lakmini well explained, there are certain specifications need to be amended before the products come into UK markets. It is because, not that the Sri Lankan ingredients are bad, but here, of course, in the UK, there's a set of different parameters applied. So the products is in Sri Lanka. So get the products first but try to have that flexibility to change the product specification before you start to import them, export them. 
because otherwise what will happen it will come into the port or maybe release if you are lucky it will be released from the port but if it go to into the market if it is captured by the authorities if they are not meeting with the right standard or specification that will be more into a product recalling and huge damage change your brand damage your money damage your relationship is damaged for example certain ingredients used in sri lanka not match or not permitted again nothing wrong with those ingredients to use in sri lanka but again there are different parameters or standards in the uk so work with your buyer work with your importer get those identified clarify them and change that product before you even think of exporting not just the ingredient labeling display modes and so product is there have the flexibility have that attitude to change that product in your portfolio and second thing i would say is many sri lankan companies are well nothing wrong with that again are very sales oriented what i mean by sales oriented don't ever imagine the minute that the your products being departed from port of sri lanka doesn't mean that that's it that's your job finished it's not something like that many sri lankans want sell 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 all what they expected from their buyer from your importer is get them to sell it sell it sell it but it's very product and sales oriented for uk market i'm afraid it won't work like that you need to be very much market oriented very much market oriented you work with your importer or you work with your buyer and you don't treat that as your buyer treat it as yours when the products comes to uk just imagine as that you are in the uk just imagine your buyer not the buyer that you are the buyer you are the person that you are distributing or you are the one who are importing it and have that under, because have, have have that understanding that flexibility that working relationship is very 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 important and entering into a right partner in uk is very much needed so identify the right partner and work with the distributor and it's like a marriage it's like a marriage once you enter into a relationship with your uh, importer or buyer you need to work with them and then you can have multiple buyers you will i'm sure that you will know what will happen in a marriage when you have multiple partners so just like that have a one partner identified be with be that partner work with that distributor or importer and try to be clear be trustworthy and support each other and work with that importer or the buyer and go along with it then we might have to start to cut it off from there uh we come back to you and maybe you can share your experience very interesting attitude be proactive be flexible consider your partners beyond just a sale your partner should be your customer and understand the customer's customer very important thank you chin we'll, we'll come back to you again shall sure. irfan thanks for waiting very patiently you served in apparel and textile industries over 20 years before venturing into business of your own we believe that inspiration for this was brought about after a visit to uk in 2011 how has the association with uk has impacted your business venture maybe if you can explain to us briefly that would be great All right. Thanks, Tanya, and and hello to all my fellow panelists and all my uh, fellow SMEs as well. Uh, so I think full disclosure first is that growing up in the 70s, I think I had a great affinity to products uh, that were coming from the UK, uh, primarily uh, based on build quality uh, and and the quality of the products that we kind of experienced. You know, I mean, some of the brands like Marmite. uh matchbox toys you know stuff like that you know so we kind of grew up with that and i obviously had a had a little uh, soft soft spot for uh, products from the uk uh so having said that yes i spent until 2011 uh, i think in the in the apparel industry and i, I had the urge to go from being a, a apparel corporate executive to becoming a farmer uh then uh, i one of the first things i did was as i looked around sri lanka our, our largest resource was was the oceans uh so i i decided uh, very quickly on on oceanic farming 
uh, and how UK was involved was because in the North Sea, uh, there was there was a hype of activity that was going on on the farming uh, on the farming aspect. So that that's what led me to the UK uh, approximately ten years ago. And when I got onto those cages in the North Sea that were producing the, the Atlantic salmon uh, and the rainbow trout, it was love at first sight, and it was something that I immediately realized that Sri Lanka needed. Uh, so for me, in terms of the relevance of this topic and and the, and the heading, I'm just going to kind of reverse reverse it a little bit, uh, and I think it would also touch upon what uh, Chin also touched upon earlier. It's it's not about having a product and wanting to sell, but in my case, I actually just wanted to uh, create an industry, bring technology, bring know-how, uh, and 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 then reverse back into the export market with the product. So that's that's the, the essentially the story. Uh, so from Scotland, what we did was we scouted for a, for a farming company that now has become my joint venture partner uh, in, in Sri Lanka. We have in Trincomalee, South Asia's first uh, uh, ocean farm and we produce uh, barramundi as, uh, or sea bus, uh, the Asian sea bus. So, so that's essentially the start of how this transition took place from a barrel. Uh, as a job, uh, you know, as an executive to becoming an entrepreneur uh, and, and becoming involved with the UK. Uh, in terms of advice, uh, you know, I, I think my, my essential message to, to our fellow SMEs would be, uh, I think also like what Chin, you know, said earlier, you know, if you want to export the product, even if you want to produce a product for the domestic market, I think the first point is that you need to make it a world-class product. Forget about all of the rest. You you know just focus on on your product, on your product development, just so that you you hit that benchmark, you hit that sweet spot. Whether it's for the domestic, the consumer, to me, is a consumer anywhere. Uh, I think that's that's one of the problems I see that you know we have a product for the domestic market and another one for the international market. I think as entrepreneurs, if we start to produce a product that's that's acceptable to the global consumer, you then have your first uh, first victory there. Uh, so in, in our case, I think the learnings that I would like to part with uh, and some of the questions I saw was, you know, I am a furniture producer, can I export? Uh, I think, you know, again, again, I would, I would, you know, just go back and see the global marketplace, uh, especially in the UK, are there furniture producers? Is there technology that we can borrow from them uh, and to make our products world class so that we are not just, an, just a national producer, we can become a global producer with global repute. So that's that's the next uh, next bit. I think in terms of also in our case, what we did, because we didn't want to take chances with the machinery and the equipment, we brought all our cage equipment from the UK, from Scotland, all the way from Scotland. Uh, again, it went against the grain of the whole business. You know, we typically would want to go and pick up some cheap equipment from somewhere. Uh, not necessarily will that help in our endeavor to you know create a world class product. So again, focus on the technology in terms of getting uh, getting the best so that you can have that uh, world class product. Again, in terms of our partnership with the UK, one of the key things that we brought into the business was environmental health and safety factors. Uh, these are things that we didn't have. Uh, we because we were setting up the first company in Sri Lanka and South Asia, there was no no pre uh, set of information that we can rely on. So we went according to the SEPA or the Scottish Environmental Protection Act and, and we kind of stuck to that. Again, that proved, uh, proved very fruitful for us later in the day. Uh, so I think these are essentially, Tanya, I'm trying to help you with reducing my time a little bit. Finally, finally, you know, you fast forward after all of these processes, we ended up with a product that really sold itself to not just the UK, but you know, to Australia, to, to to USA, and several other countries. So I would, I would not take a product and hurry to sell. I would really start focusing on the product, the technology, know how everything that goes in, then really start presenting the product to to customers wherever in the world. Yeah. So this is my few few two cents. Yeah. Great, great, Irfan. We'll come back to you. And it's a very interesting point. It's not just the product, but for you to develop a product, there is a support that you can also obtain, uh, receive from, from UK. So just don't focus on only product, but to develop your product, you can uh, get support from UK as well. Suresh, as we mentioned before, you're not a stranger to SMEs. You're helping hand to all startups. 
It's also understood that EDP works very closely with the Sri Lankan High Commission in UK to promote Sri Lankan products. Can you elaborate and make our audience aware of what support is available to SMEs to help themselves ready for the export market and to find markets overseas? Yeah. My uh, first recommendation for an SME would be to go through our website, which is uh, srilankabusiness.com. That's an easy uh, uh, one to remember because it's full of information. In fact, if there was a, a complaint, it would be that it's not, uh, it's too full. So uh, it's difficult to navigate sometimes, but go through it and then with specific questions, you can come up, come to us. We have, uh, at the moment, even for the COVID pandemic, we have 14 help desks, uh, 14 phone numbers there that people can reach out on any sector, uh, whether it's agricultural or industrial products. They can come and uh, ask us questions about how to uh, meet a certain challenge. EDB's role is to be a facilitator a promoter, a monitor, policy advisor, and a knowledge provider. So we, uh, we work very closely with the foreign missions on the promotion side and market intelligence. So we, we always know that there is, at this time, there is a trade shift going on and there is a lot of changes happening, unprecedented. So it's difficult for us to say what's going to happen tomorrow. So therefore we have to be very focused on the trends. And there are opportunities, just like we are losing some things, we are also have opportunities for new things. And um, uh, this is what the, the biggest opportunity that we have now that we didn't have a year and a half ago is this virtual conferencing technology. And today uh, we have a huge bandwidth with, uh, uh, in, in these webinars. Now, for instance, right now we have uh, 300 people participating in this webinar, which is you know, a very costly endeavor if uh, uh, we uh, had to do this physically. Now I've been, I, this is my fourth webinar for the day today. So we, ha we are constantly doing this. Uh, a month ago, I had a webinar with China, South China, with 11,000 participants. So don't, I think this is a fantastic new opportunity. Even when we used to do it physically, we could take 15 people to China, you know, or help them to go to China, but not like this. You know, they have 150 Sri Lankan entrepreneurs who participated in that. So, you know, don't underestimate the value of those things. And, and I totally agree with Irfan and, and uh, uh, Chin and everybody who's, who talked to us right now, because uh, you have to understand the market. And, and EDB can help you do that. You know, if you come with specific, uh, uh, you know, needs. First of all, do your own research, you know, and then find something that you like to do and then come to EDB and we will help you to develop that. So organizing uh, trade fairs, now some of them are virtual, then inward outbound trade delegations, which used to happen, those are also now online. We have B2B uh, meetings online, uh, business forums, and then awareness and product development uh, forums. Um, the objective, uh, of, of uh, you know, the market assistance. Uh, now, we do have periodically, we advertise uh, market assistance programs um, and develop the different assistance programs, brand development programs, local brands, um, things like that, which also are, you can find a whole list of them in the EDB website. And um, there's a lot of stuff that, that I think the easiest thing for me to do is to uh, tell you to go to the websites because you know now some of the questions I was looking at the chat line, most of them have 
uh, answers in the website. But if you don't have, please contact us, contact information. So, um, uh, you know, anything, anything goes when it comes to facilitation or promotion. You give us, you ask us a question and we'll somehow find some answers to you. EDB is an ecosystem. EDB connects with foreign missions, connects with all the government agencies, connects with all the private uh, 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 the chambers and associations. So we are sort of the government apex body and has been. And we, we have about 500 uh, members in our advisory councils, mostly private sector. So EDB is, uh, 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 has a wealth of knowledge and uh, please uh, come and we will help you. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Very, very encouraging message to all the SMEs. Please do visit uh, ETB website and you can get a lot more information than what you heard uh, just now from Suresh. Lauren, coming back to you. You know, financing is uh, one of the biggest hurdles for SMEs. I think we will all agree to that. Can you please provide advice on what are the ways in which commercial banks can provide new SME or entrepreneur to engage in export products and services and risk involved in such methods? Yeah, yes, Taniana. Uh, if I'm to explain about commercial bank, of course, we have a hundred year legacy, which uh, has come over a period. And on the very inception itself, uh, we were known as a trade bank. So we had, uh, we now see the real grooming of our large exporters, how they started on as SME customers and they have built their entire career with commercial bank and today they are one of the finest exporters in Sri Lanka. So even the other day I met one customer, he said, I've been banking with you over 35 years. And I remember the first day and he mentioned the, men, mentioned the gentleman's name who granted him the loan for around 10,000 rupees. And today he's one of the uh, top uh, exporters in a particular sector. So this is where the commercial bank has uh, catered to the entire export industry, whether it may be a small time exporter or a big time exporter. So uh, onboarding a SME, of course we have uh, the onboarding requirement. That's a normal customer due diligence that we have. And uh, we have a array of uh, many products that we can offer this customer. So it's apart from the routine uh, current account, savings account and the fixed deposits, we as a uh, we also cater to foreign currency accounts. So as an exporter, he's eligible to earn foreign exchange. He's a foreign exchange earner. So then he's entitled to open, open a business foreign currency account. So being having a uh, foreign currency cash flow, he definitely has the liberty or he has the opportunity to uh, borrow in foreign currency. So his foreign currency earnings are going to definitely benefit for him in today's context where he needs to pay off his imports if he has. So the bank won't hesitate in paying off his imports with today's context of the situation that is there. So these are some of the key products that we have on a, for an exporter. Even uh, recently, the central bank also introduced uh, a product called external commercial borrowing. So this is where if the exporter wants to, he has the liberty or has the opportunity to borrow from overseas or if there's a foreign lender willing to visit, so he can straight away go and borrow from him and those monies could come to Sri Lanka. And if he's a foreign exchange, uh, foreign exchange earner, he could set off that, uh, start paying that uh, particular loan over a period. So these are some facilities that uh, an exporter could uh, definitely uh, uh, enjoy if he, if, if he banks with us. So apart from this, uh, for SME, we onboard SME, we, when we onboard SME, we have the uh, uh, SME business circle. So that is the very initial thing where we take him on to that. From there, we elevate him based on his uh, uh, operation or based on his performance, we elevate him to a BIS club. So when he is entered into these particular categories, he enjoys a array of uh, uh, interests, uh, flexible interests, and uh, maybe a, a uh, new types of loans that I've been able to uh, give given to him. So these are some of the SME products that we have, we, where we uh, help the SMEs on. 
So if a, a exporter also has the opportunity, if he doesn't want to borrow from the bank, but if he's dealing with the bank, he wants to get to know the buyer status and the whereabouts of the buyer. So these arrangements we have, we in fact uh, go into uh, details in verifying the buyer's reports where we have arrangement with Dun & Backstreet, which is uh, one of the global uh, providers of business data analysis. So they give us reports and some sort of idea the exporter is able to uh, get. Furthermore, uh, we also have a network of more than thousand banks. We deal with it, which, which, uh, which is spread over many destinations in the world. So we can reach out to any of those destinations where the customers want to send their export items or when they want to send their documents to those destinations. So these are something that ha we have been uh, having over a period and we really thrive in uh, giving the maximum to our customer to enjoy these benefits. Uh, um, thanks a lot, Lauren. It's encouraging to know it's not just the financing itself, but you will also do a customer validation for SMEs and entrepreneurs. So that's, that's great news because that's very encouraging uh, to have such systems available with the commercial bank. Thank you. Tana, coming you. back to you, I'm sure our audience this evening would like to hear about the latest consumer trends, especially since now the UK is out of COVID restrictions. Yes, um, so uh, the, the consumer landscape has kind of shifted um, quite a bit since the pandemic. And now um, more than ever health is at the forefront of everybody's mind. And uh, because of this, the governments have been uh, sort of, uh, there's pressure uh, to take action and to introduce legislations about um, healthy foods. So as far as food is concerned, now the focus is uh, to balance healthy elements with premium flavors, because of course you eat for pleasure, you, your taste has to be, your food has to be tasty, but at the same time, it has to be healthy. Um, so as far as um, the U UK and Europe is concerned, um, at the moment there is heavy focus on what they call the uh, HSS regulations, which is um, high fat, salt and sugar free. So there's pressure on government and I think in 22 and 23 there are going to be uh, legislations about the food content and labeling regulations, like if your food has got high fat or high sugar, or high salt, uh, you have to highlight that on the label, like, like a pack of cigarettes, you have to say high fat, high salt or whatever. So you create uh, the awareness to the customers. Those legislations are coming into play. Um, and then Europe is also uh, innovating with products that uh, like have natural sweetness. I mean, that's a, that's a huge trend. Um, the, the functional fibers, what they call the um, uh, inulins, um, so where uh, the, the natural fructans um, are there. So these type of foods are incorporated into like chocolates and biscuits. So they're natural foods, uh, uh, sweeteners rather than um, artificial, like sugars or even artificial sweeteners. Um, and the other trend uh, that is evolving is the, um, the plant-based diet. So that is uh, moving from the vegan trend. Now it is more about uh, plant-based. So deriving all your, all your main part of your proteins and your nutrients from plants rather than um, animal produce. Um, that, is, that is huge. And that market is really, really evolving. Uh, so people are kind of, because um, sometimes being vegan also is not sustainable. So it's coming back to like the good old days where you balance, uh, you know, you have meat only once a week or something like that, and then try and get more nutrients out of your plant-based diet. Um, that's a huge trend. Um, and, and the other one I would say is um, traceability and sustainability. Um, customers are very, very concerned about traceability, like where it's coming from, who's making it, are they, um, are they um, using, exercising ethical uh, procedures and how it's manufactured. Um, and that's part of the sustainability, and especially the, the younger, the millennials or the Gen Z, they're very, very concerned about who to buy their products from. You know, they, they would boycott corporates who are not uh, complying to ethical 
uh, measures. So this is huge. And we ourselves, um, we are investing hugely in technology um, on traceability. So the farm to uh, fork concept is quite big. So people knowing the journey of the food that they're eating, where it's been, what has been done. So as I said, with the technology company in Sri Lanka, uh, we are investing hugely into that, into identifying the source of our product to uh, the end product. So, that, so our customer will be able to see actually which farmer has produced this food. You know, Herrera in Ambalangura has done this uh, for us to be eating it today. That level of information, it is not legislation, but that is what customers are looking for legitimate people, SMEs, small farmers, small producers, because the consumers want to support that kind of environment rather than um, going into corporate uh, consumerism. So th those are the trends. Um, yeah, so that's what we are working on heavily as well. And, and, I, and like, quite like uh, Irfan said, we are actually perfecting the process now. We are creating the product, the model, that the customers are looking for. And we are sure once we have got that done, we will be able to sell everywhere. And especially being a digital brand, we sell, sell online, we sell on Amazon, um, and we know our customers will find us. Thanks, Tana. I'd like to link that with uh, Chin. We just heard from Tana about the consumer trends, specifically the uh, being ethically produced and, and traceability in the UK market. Can you also elaborate uh, to us, who are the potential buyers in the UK market and how our consumers can reach them? Uh, well, uh, yes, Tania, I mean, uh, to, to start with, I would say that uh, many Sri Lankans, when I get the inquiries, they're asking how many Sri Lankans living in the UK and uh, what's the market for Sri Lanka. What well, I would first uh, tell to anybody who come from uh, Sri Lanka to export, uh, uh, while uh, there's a huge population of Sri Lankans are living in the UK. Still, I would recommend you to not just to consider Sri Lanka, of course, to have the authority of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is always good, but uh, far, go far beyond, which is what the, the universal supplies has been doing for the last uh, few years. And that is where the other success also uh, came in. So uh, if, if, you, uh, if you look at the markets in, uh, out of, uh, you know, from UK out of this uh, 67 uh, million population, there are about 2.8 million. Uh, uh, Asians are living in this uh, market uh, and also Afro-Caribbean of uh, 2 million as well. So, uh, and the, the good thing about uh, uh, Asian uh, people, uh, they actually stay with their taste all the time. So there's a huge uh, population in Sri Lanka uh, for Asia in, in the UK. Plus uh, the good news is like most of the uh, British people, white people now, now tend to consume a lot of Asian products, Asian products in the UK simply because of the taste and the range and also the quality of the product. So it's just, it, is a, it is a market for, um, for a diversified market. And what are the markets? There are a few uh, sectors of the market. I will translate this market into a Sri Lankan context so probably SMEs can understand betterly than uh, trying to give you a, uh, in the UK context. In, in the UK context, in, in Sri Lankan context, there's something called GT, general trade. They are always same uh, trade on. Same thing is there in the UK. We normally call as independent. We call here as independent. That's the uh, small type of shops uh, scattered uh, across the country. There's a huge uh, uh, turnaround of independent stores are there. So that's one sector that the it's just like the GT sector in here. And GT sector has, has a lot of classifications, like uh, in the GT sector itself has sort of a franchise arrangement, own shops. The owner has few shops like uh, chain stores, so convenience stores. So that sort of a GT market is there. It's a huge GT market is in the UK itself. And then yeah, there's a, another market called empty uh, here uh, in, in Sri Lankan context that goes as a, a modern trade. Uh, here, of course, same thing is there, but we normally call, don't call as empty, but if, if you categorize as empty, there are empty market here. It's called, one is the uh, wholesalers, we normally call as cash and carries for those uh, wholesalers in here. So it's just like the, the wholesalers in Sri Lanka, we normally call them as cash and carry. So if you heard the name called cash and carry, which means they are a wholesale company in the UK and also uh, supermarkets, we normally call them as uh, uh, multiples. So if you heard the name called multiples, which means the supermarket. Many Sri Lankan people, actually Asian people are asking, 
can we directly supply to supermarket? The answer to that question is more or less no. It's because that many multiples in here, supermarkets in here, do not like to work with international buyers directly. It is not because that they actually don't like to. It is just like the Khan said, traceability, responsibility, accountability is what it matters in here. And also, they just simply don't have time, money, and the labor for the custom regulation, trading standard regulation, parameters, import regulation, health regulation. So they get that, let that business to do their importers, and the 90% of the, the supermarkets in here are directly engaged with the local people, local importer or local distributor in here. So although there's a supermarket there, you know, so supplies as we are actually representing 10 major supermarkets in the UK, but the way that happened is that we represent a lot of brands from Sri Lanka into the supermarket level, but not directly because they do usually they do not entertain unless they are going for a contract manufacturing. We are just like the Nike and all this and that are happening in apparel industry. They directly go and get their production done under their own brand. So if I had to go, who are the buyers? Yes, the buyers are again the importers. There are certain importers are there. Their business is just importing. They are not into the distribution. Second type of buy importers are distributors in the UK. So then that's the second type of buyers. And third is agent. You can have your own, own agent. You can appoint your, your own agent. Or you can have your own agent or else you can be a, uh, you can represent somebody else as your agent in the UK as your buyers in there. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just a quick um, uh, a question on that. So how do, is there any any link or any suggestion how our SMEs can have easy access about this information apart from through the High Commission? Uh, uh, yes, definitely there are good ways. The best way is this, having reliable contacts and known contacts because for example, you know the supplies, we have 600 product portfolios and the labor is a huge issue in here. So but the, the last thing that the buyer wanted is waste their time and they just don't have the time. So if you if, if your uh, leads is coming from a reliable source, known party, so they always take it very serious. So try to always, maybe it's not something that you would like to listen, but that's the ground level. You know, if you have somebody, or if you try to find somebody who have some link or some reliable sources to get into the buyers, uh, inbox rather than just sending the bombard with the emails one after the other. So that's the best way. And of course, the second way is like chamber and chambers and embassies. Lakmini is doing a great job in here. So that's one of the great thing. And EDB is also there to facilitate them. And one thing I would like to address is that in the UK, there are a lot of online trade platforms and directories. For example, if I'm not allowed to say that, I would not do that, but uh, trade, trade sites like Alibaba. If you go to the Alibaba, all the Chinese business has given the facilities to Alibaba to, to find their buyers. There are same type of trade platforms, online platforms are available in the UK market. So you can get that registered your name in there and your product portfolio, your company portfolio, short one, not a lengthy emails. So these are there, so you can get that. And the business magazines, there are a lot of business magazines periodically and regularly coming out. You can advertise your company's details in there. You can also find the bias from there. So those things are also available. So just to summarize, trade contacts, the number one, cham cham embassies and chambers, EDB, of course, and online trade directories, trading platforms, and like business magazine, they're the best way to find the, the bias. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chen. Very valuable information. Uh, coming back to Dr. Lakmini, and maybe uh, Suresh also can comment about it after Dr. Lakmini. Uh, could you please explain uh, UK market access opportunities, maybe related to what Chin spoke a little while ago, and how to get the tariff benefits? Very interesting subject these days. Maybe briefly, if you can explain and give some briefing on that to our audience, we really appreciate. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Hopefully, I am being heard now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> much clearer than before. Much clearer, yeah. Sorry, and my apologies, but that could have, would have been some internet issue here. And to come in back, the tariffs are, of course, indeed, very much important uh, yeah, nowadays as well. And uh, when we talk about the market access, we all know that UK was part of the EU until 2019. And with the Brexit, UK developed their own trade policy. Very briefly, there are three areas. I mean, I would say 
the UK GT, they are global tariff, and the UK GSP scheme and FTS that they have signed with the other trading partners comprised of trade policy, uh, which was passed in 2020. So all these three are important uh, for the exporters. So let me very briefly explain how it can be important. So starting with the UK GT, that is the global tariff. This is the MFN tariff. The exporters, companies would know what the MFN tariff is. And uh, this was published in uh, uh, published on 19th May 2020. And as an outcome of the public consultation process that we had with consumers, buyers, international organizations, civil organizations, everyone. And so, uh, the thing is at this point, we also made submissions and we made submission also made a lot of presentations to give them an understanding, give them aware of Sri Lanka's situation. We were successful and we have got the needed protection of our top exporters and also from the preference erosion and the needed protection from the competitors' products as well. So that is the normal tariff, I would say. The next one, it's more everyone. Uh, UK GSP scheme. So along with the Brexit, after the Brexit, what UK implemented was the same EU GSP plus scheme as during this transition period. And thereafter, from 1st of January 2021, 1st of January this year, they replicated this EU GSP scheme. However, with, there are certain differences as per well. So in this UK GSP scheme, there are three parts. One is for the LDCs. Second one is known as the general framework, which is also similar to the general GSP scheme. And the third one, enhanced framework, that is more or less the GSP plus scheme. So under that, Sri Lanka and our exports, they benefit 0% for around 7,000 products. And the differences you may have encountered would have been the REC system. REC system is no, no longer there. A REC system is the certificate of origin. And it's more or less a self-declaration. But with the implementation of the UK GSP scheme, they have introduced the form A and statement on origin. In a minute, I will get back to that as well. But however, now we will see how this is going to be important for the export. So when someone has a great idea and product, they would always want to know the, uh, what the tariff is to understand the profitability, the profit, the pricing strategy, all along with that. Therefore, how do we know the tariff for our product? So in a minute, we will share the link, the magic link with the participants where anyone who has the code can in the FS code and get an understanding what the tariff for at the same time. If you in, if you put the competitors country or any other country you like to know what sort of tariff they are entitled for, can be you can obtain that as well to get an understanding. So third again, uh, another point I think is important here is now more or less the EU GSP scheme was replicated. But right at the moment, the UK is interested in introducing their best book and their own GSP scheme, that, uh, which is set to be implemented in 2022. And they want this to be more flexible, more relaxed, and to take away certain hindrances that had been previous EU GSP plus had been on trade. These days, there is a submission process going on, a open consultation, where whoever is interested, the company is interested, can be part of it. And we will share that link as well. There again, I want to make this point. This is uh, the mission has informed all the relevant ministries, foreign ministry, trade ministry, finance ministry, the Department of Commerce, DP chambers, and the Department of Commerce is coordinating all these submissions, sector bases as well. And also EDB is assisting them. 
and also the trade chambers are also assisting them with the uh, feedback and the comments and so on. So uh, the deadline is on the 12th of September and it's in progress and the link will be also shared if someone is interested. And this is a, another opportunity. If you have a product if, or in the future, you want to have that product to give your comments, to consider it as a zero product, if zero duty product, if it is not already uh, a zero duty product at the moment. So it's an opportunity. And at the same time, you may wonder how, what is the process? You will, you have the product, now you have an idea of the tariff and the competitor's tariff as well. How should I get about? The next stage would be, if you are very serious about exporting to the UK market and if you have found an exporter as well, you will have to register with the Department of Commerce. And thereafter, periodically, you will have to give them the information about the shipments because in this scheme, in this process, there is, the UK authority will ask for verification in the future. For that, basically for that matter, we will be asking, the Department of Commerce will be asking for certain data to be recorded in the office. And once you are registered with them, you can proceed. And the only thing is, you, if your product is eligible, they will say it's eligible. And also, based on the cost statements and so on, they will tell you whether this product is eligible for the UK PSP scheme. And uh, so you don't have to pay any money to obtain any certification because it's a self-declaration that you have to make and you can proceed. So I think I would have answered one question from Yuta Zaruk who had asked about the certification when exporting. So basically, I think I have covered Tani. If there are any more specific questions, I'll be very happy to answer, yes. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Lakmini. Uh, Suresh, can you briefly uh, take that on and, and give you your comments. Then we will take a few questions from our participants. Yeah, I think Dr. Lakmini explained the UK context very well, but there is something very, very important that uh, the SMEs need to understand. And that's something that Irfan talked about very clearly. And even my personal experience exporting, I feel that something that is missing uh, in the SMEs in Sri Lanka, they do not uh, seem to um, value uh, relationships. Now, whether it is with your bank or your joint venture partner or your customer or the EDB, you have to develop a relationship. And I am finding that most of the successful uh, exporters have built these relationships. And some that are struggling are the ones who don't have a good relationship. They are unable to go to the banks for financing. They are unable to come to the EDB because they have maybe let the EDB down somewhere down the road. Or, or you see, I think that building, it's like a customer and you have to put yourself in a customer's shoes. Now, recently I was asked a question about can't the EDB get direct links for SMEs? So when we look at a, a customer, when a customer comes to the EDB and wants a, a supplier, the customer wants a recommendation, wants a track record. And, and usually even if we go, if we put ourselves in the customer's shoes, that's what we would want, right? So this is something we have to give very important consideration to, is that the, you know, don't get angry with the EDB when a customer doesn't uh, take on your product, because what, what it really means is you have to build a relationship. And usually you, I mean, the best way now, like Irfan did and I did, we did it with joint venture partners. They gave us the technology, they explained to us about the markets, and we are able to do a world-class product. So we focused on developing a world-class product with technology and expertise and even financing from joint ventures. Sri Lankans in general 
I think when you, like in, in the US, whether it was Apple or Microsoft or any other company, really, they are, they are all joint ventures. There, were, there was equity funding. In Sri Lanka, we always go to loan funding or loan shark funding when it comes to SMEs. Now, this is, this is where, where I think we fail, is because, you know, the banks are not exporters, okay? The banks just give you money and they will maybe teach you some financial literacy. But if you had a joint venture partner, they would give you sometimes the market and also the, uh, the uh, technology. So I would encourage people to build these relationships. And today, now 40 years ago, when I started my business, I had to travel all over the world to learn about it. And fortunately, I was overseas at the time and I was able to learn. And like Irfan said, what he learned in Scotland, I, I was on the other side, I was catching fish. And, uh, you know, I learned, learned the sport and I learned what my customers wanted. And it was quite easy for me to develop a product and a niche product, because I think Sri Lanka is ideally suited for niche products. Now, Chin very clearly said about us being unable to supply a supermarket. Now, you see, Sri Lanka is a small country. And the most important thing, if you're going to do to a supermarket is volume and price. And those are two things Sri Lanka has always struggles with, okay? In anything, whether it's uh, apparel or, or food products or agriculture, anything, we, we don't have the capacity. If you look at every successful uh, factory or, or, or uh, exporter in Sri Lanka, they will tell you they have capacity issues, okay? Whether it's agricultural produce, everybody has capacity issues. And that is where a lot of times your buyers get frustrated because you are not a reliable supplier. So I always say there are three very, very important things. One is quality. It's very important, like Shin explained. Two is price. And three is capacity, volume. Those three things are invaluable. Then the rest is building relationships and all that. But, but I, I think if we look at things in that way, see, you know, there are, there are more things now, like one of the other important things, of course, is the segment, the market segment that you are going to supply. So that's where I was going to say niche markets, smaller markets are more suited for Sri Lanka. Okay. Because, you know, and, and also I think uh, Lamborghini markets are more suited for Sri Lanka because we are a smaller country, you know. I mean, let's not try to say Lamborghinis from Lamborghinis all the way to Marutis because those are different consumers. Uh, Suresh, I okay. might have to interrupt yeah. you a little bit. Thank you because of the time constraint. We would like to take one question from uh, at this moment from the participants. There are so many questions about the documentation process and how to find new buyers and market segment. Please reach out to um, EDB website or uh, Dr. Lakmini has given a link I saw in the, the qu uh, question and answer box. Please uh, directly contact them. Uh, this is a different question. Actually, it's for Chin. Uh, social media is now a large component of business, especially for startups as SMEs. Social media definitely works in Sri Lanka, but does social media work? in UK. I think in terms of business promotion and so on, I think that's that's the question uh, on, on. Yeah, I think it's a very uh, a tricky question, Tanya. Uh, well, as well as it's a tricky question, uh, I'll be honest and I'll give you a very uh, uh, honest answer for that. Yes and no. Why do I say that? Because that's the honest answer. But if you precisely ask me uh, whether that works with the B2C, business to consumers, definitely does. Because one of the, uh, among the world, uh, social media usage in the UK is over 97%. So you know, over and above 80 plus uh, people also use the social media quite a lot. But they are still on a very uh, uh, pragmatic and a professional level. What I mean by pragmatic and promotional level, they are into their daily watching of their movie or a clip or a news or some sort of a social, social uh, thing. 
so uh, the, whether the buyers can really get attracted from the social media campaign uh, i would be a bit reluctant to say yes for that but then again yes definitely if you happen to have a, a product being launched in the uk through your agent or distributor your either your own brand or their private label or anything work with your distributor and then get that your product promoted and uh, make that awareness happen through the social media definitely it would work 100% it would work for the business to consumers but business to business for example if you want to find the buyer or if you want to find the uh, like suresh at the uh, if you want to find a, a supermarket suresh will explain the requirement of what you need to have uh, to be done plus that uh, if you want to find the the so, uh, if you want to use a social media to find a buyer i would say think about uh, before you spend money on it uh, because just going with normal social media wouldn't work but there are uh, prime services are available i'll give you two simple example let's say linkedin if you happen to use the linkedin there's a payment of linkedin one that you can subscribe to the linkedin you can get the buyers details by subscribing to the this linkedin it's a, you know it's a premium service even with the youtube for example if you looked at the youtube you can see the, if there's an ad going on you can skip the ad but there are some ad there are some ad you can't skip off that you have to pay a premium for that so if you're thinking of using the social media to get the buyers attraction you need to force the buyer to watch into that by going into this this type of a premium subscription otherwise think twice hope that help and uh, thank you very much and we will take uh, one more question uh, related to i think it's directed to lorian um, apart from the financial hurdle with the bank doc, bank then documentation too is stressful process for the business what are the document required by the bank to claim export proceeds and is there any online resources that smes can access to get this update uh yes so really speaking the requirement of document uh, came into effect very recently where the regulators brought in a re instruction saying that all exporters need to repatriate their money back to the country within 180 days in order to ascertain this requirement uh, uh, when a remittance hits to a bank uh, the banks require the exporter to furnish the data so then uh, that's by way of uh, giving a invoice or maybe a caustic or the bill of lading in order to verify whether it's export proceeds and based on that uh, they send in a report to central bank so uh, if you it, it all depends on the method you handle method of payment that you export to your buyer so if you are going to export on uh, maybe on open account terms the banks don't know anything about that they don't get to know anything up front basically when the money comes into the bank or the remittance hits the bank only or the client's account at that moment the bank queries on the exporter to say confirm whether this is export proceeds or what so in line with the regulations they we need to furnish uh, uh, the data to the uh, regulator saying that uh, this is export proceeds and this uh, this is this is what has come on the export that has been done by this particular client so but if you handle a payment term which is uh, on dp or lc so these are secured methods of uh, payment where the banks themselves handle it and forward it to the uh, buyers bank so those data of course are upfront provided by the exporter and so there is no requirement uh, for them to furnish it uh, at the time the money is come to the uh, country so the monitoring part of the export proceeds repatriation is monitored by the bank but when it comes to open account transaction the banks don't get involved into the documentation so then this is where the, uh, the exporters themselves need to uh, furnish the required documents to the bank so you find these uh, the clients of we have the option we have our online banking system where the uh, clients can access that and forward those relevant documents or even a email of a particular transaction we can uh, uh, match the transaction and we can update the data with the regulators so it's not a issue in this only thing the data needs to come to the banks in order to uh, update the regulators on time so one more thing the recent regulations that they brought in that there's a 24% conversion of 
the dollar remittance that export proceed. So that's been done. I think all the exporters know about that. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Lauren. Uh, there's a, a different question. Um, I, I'll, I'll open it to the panel. Uh, whoever is, uh, has expertise in this area can, can probably answer this. Given the shortage in labor since Brexit, are there opportunities for service outsourcing in the BPO industry post COVID? What is the market like for these companies? Maybe Dr. Lakmini uh, or can answer that in, in brief. I think we have to close the session very soon. Dr. Lakmini, so appreciate in brief your, your input on that. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Yes, uh, we have seen, uh, in, especially in the service sector as well, there is a demand. And uh, maybe that I could refer to one event that we did with SLASCOM. That was called the Global Referral Program. Where well, we, uh, again, DB was also part of it. And what we did was we went to the diaspora and we wanted the professionals, actually British professionals, to introduce our services to the, their companies. So that was one area that we promoted. And yes, we see a lot of opportunities in the BPO sector, and we intend to uh, have a webinar as well to discuss more about the fintech and other areas. Yes. Thanks, Thank, you. Dr. Thank, you. Thank you. There's a question, uh, how has the skyrocketing freight rates affected exports? I would recommend, uh, we have a, a session uh, uh, planned uh, com on coming Friday. So whoever has posted this question, please uh, uh, log in to CBB website and look for that session. And maybe you can get some insight to what's happening with uh, regard to the spike in freight rates and the capacities. So please do um, log in uh, on Friday. Uh, so um, one more question we have now. Anya, can I just uh, interrupt for a second? Yes. Um, one, as a, as an importer, I'm also struggling with uh, freight availability. So if you would share that uh, link, I would be happy to attend that. Uh, two, about the BPO question, um, just to add to what Dr. Lakshmi said, um, I have been independently doing some um, work on the BPO sector with some of the Sri Lankan BPO companies. And uh, the state of the market in the UK at the moment is it's quite mature because the BPO industry like started 20 years ago and uh, the big players are uh, like sort of in a very mature stage. So for new companies to enter into that, they have to provide a niche service. Like for example, um, when there is a legislation change, there is a reporting change, for example, in accounting, um, there is a GDPR regulation or there is an um, environmental uh, green finance reporting or something like that. When there is a change, then the companies um, need some extra support. So it's for BPO companies to look into those areas and provide a specialized niche service will be important. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Tana. There's so many questions, but unfortunately, we cannot answer them individually. Uh, but I'm sure uh, during our session, we, we managed to address most of it. So in conclusion, on behalf of Commercial Bank, PLC, and CBB, I would like to ex express my sincere appreciation to the speakers and the panelists for their valuable contribution to this session today. Our deepest gratitude goes to all who have attended this session and helped to make it much a successful event with over 250 participation. Please look out for the follow-up session in the next couple of weeks. I will, now, I will now hand it over to Dirshan Fernando, manage SME at Commercial Bank to deliver the thank you note and conclude today's event. Stay safe and I wish you all the very best. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you, Tanya. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We just concluded a very interactive and informative webinar conducted jointly by Commercial Bank and CBB Council for Bus Business with Britain. Export opportunity to Great Britain. We trust this webinar has provided all of our participants to gain lots of insights and knowledge which will definitely assist them in their future endeavors. On behalf of the Commercial Bank, as one of the partners of this webinar, we wish to express our gratitude towards the team headed by Rosh Roshani of CBB, 
who came forward and joined hand with us to organize this important webinar. We also wish to thank Mr. Ranganathan, our CEO, and the management of their and management of the commercial bank for their continuous support extended to make this event a success. We received great support from Dignity of Chamber of Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, who initiated most of the dialogues within our institution to move this event forward. We are indeed thankful to you, Dignity. We had a really eminent panel of for this webinar, starting from Dr. Lakmini Mendis, Minister Commercial, representing Sri Lankan High Commission in UK. Mr. Suresh Dimel, Chairman, CEO of EDB Sri Lanka. Ms. Lorian Somanada, Chief Manager, Export Department of Commercial Bank, who shared their valuable insights, which were more relevant for those who wishes to do business with UK and also to expand their existing business with UK. Madam, sir, please accept our gratitude for adding more color to this program. Further, our sincere thanks goes to uh, Ms. Thana Sivil Sabdu, the founder and the CEO of Rusi Foods, Mr. Irfan Tasi, the CEO of Ocean Peak Private Limited, and Mr. Chin Pereira, the Director of Universal Supply Limited, for sharing their hands-on experience regarding the business that they currently continue with UK. Also, how they overcame the difficulties and challenges that they faced when doing business with UK. I hope this would give some encouragement to our participants who are willing to do business with UK. Tanya, our moderator, did a superb job of updating the entire webinar in a very meaningful manner, making it more fruitful one for the audience. Tanya, council member of CBB, please accept our sincere thanks. We, there were many more from Commercial Bank and CBB were behind this effort. Without their support, this event could not have become a reality. Dear friends, thank you very much for your tireless efforts toward this event. Finally, and more importantly, we wish to thank all the participants who registered and joined with us today. You have kept nearly more than uh, 90 minutes, nearly uh, two hours uh, out of your busy schedule to be with us and gain more knowledge on export to Great Britain. Without your participation, this will not a successful one. Once again, thank you very much. Let me share a famous quotation from Mr. Henry Ford to conclude. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. We have come together and it's very good beginning. Let, let us progress together and be successful in our endeavors. We as commercial bank will be with you always in your journey towards success. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. Uh, before we conclude, uh, I, uh, may I request from all the participants, please log in to CBB website or contact Chamber of Commerce uh, if you like to obtain membership of CBB. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.